the, 20, the 2021 Grace Holt celebration. Um, this webinar is now being recorded. Um, we are here today to um, talk about uh, the AIDS crisis, I'm sorry, the COVID crisis, uh, which is uh, a pertinent issue for Black Studies. My name is Jane Rhodes, and I'm the head of the Black Studies Department and a professor here at UIC. And we have a wonderful array of guests here to uh, help us work through this. Please stay uh, throughout the program because at the end, we are going to pay tribute to our students uh, in Black Studies and their accomplishments. Um, I wanna just say congratulations to everyone, particularly the students, but also faculty and staff for finishing off what was a very challenging academic year. Uh, we made it, we got through it. Um, and uh, I think we all um, need to take a sigh of relief uh, that we are starting to come out the other end. Um, I want to thank uh, Brianna Haney and Marina Alvarez, our two amazing staff for organizing this program. And I just want to spend a quick moment to tell you about Grace Holt, for whom this event is named. Grace Holt, for those of you who don't know, was the founder of this department. Uh, she uh, came to Chicago in the 1940s, earned a degree in communication from Northern Illinois University, and she became a professor in 1969 at UIC, not long after the university was established. Uh, she started a Black Studies program in 1971. So that's how old our department is. Um, and she was uh, the director until 1986. So she really birthed this department and her visions remains with us today. Um, she organized the first UIC Black History Month activities. She founded the Black History Month Planning Committee, and she was an enormously active in the Chicago community as well as on campus. Um, she retired from UIC in 1990 and died a year later, and her family endowed a fund to the department to help fund student awards and scholarships. So we want to always uh, express our thanks to the Holt family for that. Now I'm going to turn things over to uh, my colleague, Professor Ainsworth Clark, who is going to moderate this morning's session. All right. <clears throat> thank you, Jane. Um, and thank you all for being here today for what uh, will be an informative, invigorating, and I'm sure empowering conversation on the local and global impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on Black people's lives. Uh, we're grateful to have with us today four thought-provoking speakers who will lead us in this conversation. Uh, I'll be introducing our panelists first, after which I'll turn it over to them. And once uh, they've all concluded, uh, we'll follow up with a Q&A and discussion. Um, we'll hold all the questions uh, for the end, but please send them to us via the chat, and we'll be monitoring those um, uh, to contribute to our later conversation and discussion. So uh, now I'd like to introduce our panelists. Uh, our first panelist, our first speaker will be Dr. Kim Gallen. She's an associate professor of history. Her work investigates the cultural dimensions of the black press in the early 20th century. She's the author of numerous articles and essays, uh, as well as the book, Pleasure in the News, African-American Readership and Sexuality in the Black Press, published by our own University of Illinois, Press um, in 2020. Dr. Gallen is currently at work on two new projects, Technologies of, Rec Technologies of Recovery, Black Digital Humanities Theory and Praxis, a book about the Black Digital Humanities as a site of resistance and liberation, and a, another book titled Fiction for the Harassed and Frustrated, which examines the role and significance of popular literary expression in the Black press in the early 20th century. Uh, she also currently serves as the inaugural editor uh, for the Black Press in America book series at Johns Hopkins University Press. Dr. Gallen is also the founder and director of two Black Digital Humanities projects, the Black Press Research Collective and COVID Black, a task force on Black health and data. Uh, Dr. Gallen will be speaking to us today about data and the limits and possibilities it holds for helping us understand the full impact of the COVID-19 pandemic on Black people's lives. Our second panelist is Dr. Karen Watson. 
who is a community health scientist who serves as the associate executive director of the Mile High Health Center. He also serves as the associate director of community outreach and engagement for the University of Illinois Cancer Center at UIC and has a faculty appointment at the, in the UIC School of Public Health as a research assistant professor. His research is focused on cancer prevention and control and mitigating the impact of social determinants of health on chronic conditions such as hypertension and diabetes. Uh, his research and publications are deeply rooted in community engagement and health equity and expanding diversity in clinical trials. In his role as Associate Executive Director at Mile, Mile Square, Dr. Watson has worked with his community outreach and community engagement team and director of operations to ensure outreach and engagement for COVID-19 testing and vaccination is rooted in culturally sensitive care. He will share today the ways in which efforts at the center to ensure that their outreach engagement activities for COVID-19 address justified historical mistrust access and vaccine hesitancy has resulted in successful testing and vaccine efforts. Our third speaker, Dr. Jarrah Harrington, is an assistant professor of Black Studies at the University of Illinois at Chicago. Uh, joining us here in the Black Studies faculty uh, just this past academic year. Uh, prior to this faculty position, uh, Dr. Harrington served as the 2017-2018 William J. Fulbright postdoctoral scholar in Brazil and earned her doctorate in political science in the subfield of comparative politics at the University of Chicago. Her current research and writing focuses on the union organizing of domestic workers in unions in Brasilia, Sao Paulo, and Salvador. Dr. Harrington will help us understand today that while the health profession's brutal legacy of Brazilian Black women's undervalued labor is romanticized by notions of intimacy and care, life and death policy decisions around domestic workers during the COVID-19 pandemic underscores their community's vulnerable status. And our final speaker today uh, is Dr. Jennifer Breyer, who is director of UIC's program in Gender and Women's Studies and a professor in the Department of History. Dr. Breyer's research and teaching are largely focused on exploring the historical intersections of gender, race, and sexuality. She is also an active public historian, working to make history useful and meaningful to communities well beyond the academy. Her first book, Infectious Ideas, U.S. Political Response to the AIDS Crisis, published in 2009 at the University of North Carolina Press, argues that AIDS provides the perfect lens through which to see the complex social and political history of the 1980s and 1990s. Dr. Breyer is also actively engaged in producing public history. She co-curated the award-winning exhibition out in Chicago on LGBT history in Chicago at the Chicago History Museum, as well as Surviving and Thriving, AIDS, Politics and Culture, a traveling exhibition for the National Library of Medicine. Uh, Dr. Breyer is currently leading a team of UIC faculty, students, and staff that will sorry, to build a community curated mobile gallery called History Moves that will provide a space for Chicago-based community organizers and activists to share their histories with a wide audience. Uh, Dr. Barr will be talking to us today about the Living Women's History of HIV AIDS project she's working on with a group of long-term surviving women, the majority of whom are Black. In addition to focusing on how public history might help us to imagine and enact healthier presence and futures, Dr. Breyer will also highlight how the women's survival strategies and demands for health care that is more than treating disease or strictly medical provide us with models for thinking about what it will take to recover from and with COVID-19. And now I would like to welcome our first panelist, Dr. Kim Gallup. Thank you very much for those introductions. They were very helpful. And I also want to say thank you to a UIC Chicago Black Studies Department, specifically Jane Rhodes, Dr. Jane Rhodes. And then congratulations to all the, the soon to be graduates. I'm going to share my screen. Um, and if someone can just confirm that you can see it, that will be helpful to me um, just to make sure that I'm not starting before people can see. 
Everything looks okay? Looks good. That's great. Um, my talk today um, is going to be covering um, uh, the digital project uh, that comes out of COVID Black, our, our first major digital project, trans uh, Homegoing. And the title of my talk is Transforming the Datafication of Black Death into Recovery and Re Restoration of Black Humanity. So I'm going to briefly start off with where we are today. I think one of my uh, co-panelists will be going much more deeper into data. I just wanted to give uh, people a sense of where we are today with the, the COVID-19 uh, data as it relates to race. A year ago, however, uh, during at this time in April of 2020, I wouldn't have been able to show you this data from the CDC. Um, one of the ways that COVID Black even started was calling out the very um, scattered, very uh, Death, uh, disparate um, data that was being collected uh, by the government, by states and federal government uh, initially when uh, COVID uh, was emerging as this uh, pandemic that would impact people of color and impact everyone in the United States. So this is where we are today with uh, deaths by race and Hispanic origin. Um, one of the biggest uh, data um, trackers that people are now following is the vaccination data. Um, and the KFF, uh, the Kaiser Family Foundation has a really good vaccine monitor that I would recommend people go to if they wanna look at where their state is. And right now I just have a screenshot for just a portion of uh, the data for the different states on um, black people. And as you can see, if you look at the data, you will see that the percent of, rep of vaccinations generally is underrepresented based on the proportion of black people in that state, but the deaths are overrepresented, right? Based on the proportion of black people in the United States. And that's a general trend where we're seeing uh, white Americans who are overrepresented in vaccinations and underrepresented in deaths, right? Um, and so there's been lots of uh, discussions of why this is the case. Uh, some people will talk about vaccine hesitancy and historical mistrust and distrust, which uh, clearly that's at play, but many people are really pointing to access, right? With a uh, vaccine um, ability to get the vaccine overrepresented for some uh, communities. So I just wanted to quickly touch on the data. But where we started as COVID Black was really trying to uh, approach data from a humanistic perspective and to use technology and just simply social media to call out to other faculty members across the United States to push their local health departments to start collecting and publishing data on um, on COVID-19. And so COVID Black grows out of the idea and the premise that uh, faculty, uh, humanists specifically, can use their skills uh, and connections to engage in a, in a first sort of response sort of way. Um, and I can talk a little bit more about that as we go along. One of the things that um, COVID Black was at least initially concerned with was obviously the collection of data, but the ways that the data was starting to obscure some of the, the people and the stories and the impact of the Black community. So quantitative data, big data is always going to do that. That's something that people have talked about. It's not necessarily new, but it becomes a, uh, a problem. And I would argue that humanists specifically have a role to play in humanizing the data. And that's what COVID Black really wanted to do was humanize the data and take the data from uh, charts and bar graphs and statistics and then bring stories to that data in a way that will really connect to uh, people's lives but specifically black people. And so that data, um, humanizing the data has meant looking at unstructured data and looking at obituaries, death announcements, social media posts, anywhere where we can find information about black people that have died, we have taken that unstructured data and actually uh, entered it into a spreadsheet. And we've broken those categories down by age, gender, date, location, occupation, and whether someone was African born or born in the in the diaspora to get at a more expansive notion of blackness. As to date, we have a, a data set of about close to 800 people um, that unfortunately continues to grow. It's one of those data sets that grows because people die. And that's a little of a complexity that we always are grappling with. Nonetheless, we've realized that in collecting this data and any data that you collect specifically around race is fraught with a whole set of issues 
obituaries, death announcements that you might get in a newspaper. They don't uh, identify people racially and race is a social construct and people who may appear to uh, be racially ambiguous, again, based on the artificial notion of what we call black in the United States, this racial phenotype, uh, it leads to a whole set of issues, right? Uh, when you're trying to define people who don't line up phenotypically the way that we believe black people do. Um, also, people don't identify whether they wanna be black, African-American, just American. So we've had to make choices about how we define people based on very problematic constructions that we that are steeped, quite frankly, in hierarchies and oppression. Um, and we're writing about this and dealing with this. I, I, and I'll talk a little bit about this uh, more. I wanna just keep moving for the, the sake of time, but this is a screenshot of what our data set looks like. We took that data and we um, did some very conventional things with that data. We created pie chart. Uh, we created sort of a spatial representation. The gray areas do not represent that there are no black people who died in that area, but there's a lack of data, right? We rely again on newspapers, death announcements, and those tend to focus more on the areas of the country that are heavily populated by black people. Um, just some other examples of our data, again, looking quite conventional in the way that we have uh, tried to represent it. And this data generally uh, um, mirrors the national trends, meaning that there's more uh, black men that have died from COVID than black women. Um, the age also represents uh, the national data. So we, we learned that our data set really matches the national data. And then we also created a map to, to uh, represent um, the you know spatially black people, but we were concerned about what uh, the the datafication, and we wanted to get past the datafication. So we were driven by this idea of mourning when traditional rituals um, and practices are impossible. We wanted to know how you could use technology to memorialize loss of life in the context of structural racism, and we also wanted to know how we might use technology to recognize and humanize black people when they're often not humanized in life. And what we can came up with, um, and I'm going to have to stop sharing, I'm going to share really quickly again, because I, I left that. Um, and hold on for one second, I'm sorry, just when you're trying to get the technology, uh, let me just use this, okay. Um, what we came up with is, is home going, which is a, a memorial um, an interactive memorial to Black people. Um, you can see that it's interactive. Um, the internet is a little bit slow when you're trying to share, but on this side are images of, of Black people. Um, when you click on the uh, homegoing symbols, they light up. Um, there's a movement of transcending and transitioning. It's not really coming up now because the, the internet is slow and I apologize about that. But we were trying to capture this notion of home going as it relates to black, uh, the, the black cultural practice of transitioning back to your ancestral homeland. So I'll quickly just show you that when you click on the symbol, it lights up and the corresponding image of the person lights up. The length of the symbol represents the length of life that someone had. So longer symbols represent longevity. Unfortunately, shorter symbols represent someone who was younger in life. And even the, the, even the most shortest ones represents um, you know, very young people. Um, and then one can click on uh, a symbol and a, a story of that person opens up. Um, so we were trying to get at this notion of home going, trying to um, represent the lives of Black people in a way that transcended the datafication, that made it clear that there's data can only tell us certain things, quantitative data, and that we need other types of visualization and other types of um, uh, technology and practices that will allow for a deeper, deeper story. So as a closing, you know, as we think about this new phase of our COVID reality, because COVID's not going away, we got to think about the limits of data, what it can and what it can't tell us, uh, how we can see ourselves and our potential selves in the data and stretch our imagination about what data can tell us and understand that uh, 
uh, incomplete or sample or partial data can only animate so much that we need other uh, practices and other tools and technologies and stories to actually fill out the gaps that quantitative data leaves us with. So I welcome you to follow COVID Black on Twitter. And again, I wanna say thank you for your time. I look forward to engaging you in the, in the answer and questions. Thank you so much, Dr. Gallo, uh, for a wonderful presentation. And now I'd like to invite um, Dr. Watson. Thank you so much. And Dr. Gallo, thank you. I could have, I almost don't wanna go, I wanna, <laughs> You know, give my time back to you to hear more about your amazing work. And and I do, I would be remiss if I didn't start off with the fact that you talked about mourning and culture and the home going piece of it. Um, I, I have to sit in this space as my full and authentic self. And I come to this space actually having coming off in the 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 recent death of my oldest brother, um, who was a social activist um, and in his, in his own right and who did a lot of political activism and alongside my nephew and he died from complications of colorectal cancer um, on the 16th, on April 16th, a couple of weeks ago. And we were able to have a service for him on last Saturday. And in that process of having that service for my brother, one of the main things that my sister-in-law and my older sisters wanted to know was, are we going to be able to honor him? Are we going to be able to honor his legacy? And I, I felt so, you know, because of privilege, I would, we were able to do certain things, you know, we were even able to order individualized lunches for a repast because I told them I'm not willing to contact trace my family if you all have a repast and I am not coming. But, you know, so they had a, a phone call and said, well, how can we honor this through that way? And so, but I thought about the way that we were able to honor him through this, through even convening with around food and family and passing out those individual lunches. And I thought about the way privilege and power even showed up, even in the way we memorialize our loved ones. So I, I have to start off there by grounding that conversation and bringing my full self to this space. Mm -hmm. So thank you for that. I'm just gonna briefly walk you all through just a little bit about my role in the Federally Qualified Health Centers, FQHCs. And I'm gonna pull up my slide and if someone could verbally let me know when I am sharing my screen. Yeah. You see it. Yep. Uh oh. Is it showing? Yes, but your screen is dark now. We can see it now. Yes. Okay. Perfect. Thank you all. And so I'm going to just talk a little bit about understanding the root causes of justified medical mistrust. And we use this term justified medical mistrust because as a fairly qualified health center, we actually, our roots are actually deep, our roots began as a community health center out of the war on poverty in the 1960s. So every community health center that exists in the United States exists because of the work of people like Dr. King and others who once they saw, and so even our name, um, and, and I wanna thank uh, Professor Clark, you know, for our name, Miles Square, people say, well, Kareem, where did the name Miles Square come from? Well, because our name came from the fact that we started out of the public housing. We started because a group of residents in public housing got together and they recognized we, and Dr. Gallen talked about data, for one square mile on the Chicago's west side, we carried some of the greatest morbidity and mortality data in the United States for one square mile in the public housing sector of Chicago. And that's how we got our name Mile Square, that we wanted to change that, that concept of that data being more about health disparities and for it to be more about the fact that we are addressing and mitigating those that data. And so our work is also rooted in this concept of structural violence, because as an FQHC, we can't talk about what happens in terms of COVID-19 without talking about the structural inequities that exist. And so this is some work, this is, this is a directly pulled out of a center that we have here at UIC called the Center for Health Equity Research, where our primary focus is to aim and ground our work in structural violence, where we're looking at social justice policies, how those social justice policies lend themselves to inequities like racism, social class, and heteronormity, how those things are then played out at a neighborhood level and an individual social position and then how neighborhood processes and then individual processes lead to these health inequities. We saw this directly related to COVID-19, directly related to what we saw through the pandemic. And so 
when we began to do our work around thinking about our outreach and engagement efforts for COVID-19, I have to have to give a shout out to our COO, our Chief Operating Officer, Ms. Phyllis Grice, an, uh, uh, an amazing leader who said that, Kareem, as we roll out our testing and vaccinations, we have to roll them out understanding the barriers that will exist within our community areas. So I wanna also quickly show you all these two maps. So look, these are, and this data is from January, but it's, unfortunately it has not changed that much. So this is a heat map, and you can, this data is public. You can go to Chicago Department of Public Health and get this data. Look at the heat map on the left, that's mortality rate by zip codes. And I highlighted there a zip, a zip code 60649, that's the South Shore area. And the reason I highlighted that zip code is because we actually have a clinic in that area. Because one of the things that fairly qualified health centers do, we are located in areas called medically underserved areas or MUAs. And that's how we receive our federal funding by going to the root cause, you know, the communities that are impacted by these root causes, right? So look at that data. Now look at the top circle I have there in the zip codes around the Gold Coast. So if you look at mortality in the Gold Coast, it was less than 10.1 to 37.1 per 100,000 people in the Gold Coast. But look at what's happening in South Shore. You had 219 to 312 deaths per 100,000 people in that South Shore zip code. And so look at what's happening in the South and West Side communities in terms of mortality data. Now go to the map on the right, where you look at percent tested by zip code. 60649 is the exact opposite for testing compared to mortality. We have to do better. We have to do better. And I can, the same type of data is now existing in terms of the heat map. So this is another heat map. So I just wanna go back, remember that 60649 zip code, that circle red here on the left, mortality. Remember that 60649 on the right with testing, by testing. And now look at this, that same community area, and I apologize that I, I didn't circle it here, but this is by vaccine uptake. So when we set out to do our testing, and our vaccines, we did not set out to do them in an isolated outreach and engagement effort. We said the same populations, because another thing that we did prior to COVID-19, and I have to thank students from the urban medicine program, was that we did a survey. And in that same South Shore community, we found out that 87% of our patients from our South Shore clinic had identified as food insecure. So in March of last year, when we rolled out our COVID testing, procedures, we didn't just roll out our COVID testing. We partnered with St. Luke Missionary Baptist Church in South Shore. We partnered with community-based organizations. We partnered with Cater Not the Box, a minority-owned um, vendor company, to deliver and distribute over 8,000 boxes and um, bags of groceries to our patients because we understood that to address the testing needs without addressing those already existing issues around food insecurity and food access would be only, we actually would probably be widening the gap of inequities and not narrowing that gap. And the other thing we did is that we started, we grounded our analysis in history. I love the fact that this is the Dr. Grace Holt Memorial Lecture. We understood and we showed this, I showed this map to our staff several times and said, listen, this is a historical timeline of why some of our patients may not get tested and why some of our patients may not be so quick to get the vaccine. Let's, I, I walked them through what happened from a historical analysis in terms of what happened from 1932 to 1972 in the National Public Health Syphilis Study at Tuskegee. We inappropriately call that the Tuskegee Study. I don't call that the Tuskegee Study. I call it the National Public Health Syphilis Study at Tuskegee, Alabama, because we want to make a nomenclature and naming matters. And then we talk about what also happened in 1951 with Henrietta, Henrietta Lacks and her cells being unknowingly used. So I said, all that is historical memory. That's historical trauma that many of our patients live with. And so we, we trained our staff and engaged our staff on that historical trauma and have the, on how to have conversations rooted in healing and rooted in acknowledging our past so that we can say that all of that is brought to our patients' lived experience and how they're going to be compliant with our rollout of the vaccine and how they're gonna be compliant with our rollout of testing. And so this is a picture of one of my favorite fan out. This is a picture of four generations of the family of Henrietta Lacks. So back in 2017, I had the privilege of being able to roll out our NIH All of Us research study. And as part of the rollout for that study, I convened a group of community partners. And what started off as a small town hall forum for us to address 
health disparities that exist in clinical trials, ended up with a 600 attendee, 600 community members attending a town hall forum with four generations of the family of Henrietta Lacks. And at that town hall forum, I met Veronica Robinson, the great granddaughter of Henrietta Lacks and befriended Veronica. And now we go on the speaking circuit together. And I call on Veronica on a regular basis so she can hold me accountable. And I run things by her. And I ask Veronica those tough questions of, would your great grandmother be proud of the way that I'm rolling out this research study? Would your great grandmother, is, are we honoring her legacy in the way that we're providing testing, in the way that we're providing the vaccine? And Veronica is no holds barred, right? She lets me know. And so when we gave her a tour of Miles Square and what we did, this is a quote from Veronica, the great granddaughter of Henry the Lacks, where she says, Chicago, everything I've seen today at Miles Square, you are keeping the community engaged and you are exactly what we are about. And as a result of that, I formed a partnership with the Lacks family so that we can partner on begin to mitigate these issues of medical, justified medical mistrust. But the, the Lacks family is not only addressing the lack of inclusion of black and brown communities in research, they're also addressing the lack of inclusion of black and brown people as the researchers, because we understand that representation matters, who's asking the question matter, and where we're asking the question also matters. Because um, another thing that we talked about is that where our patients get their care. And I tell my students and our staff, we don't have to look far to see that structural racism still exists in cancer screenings. This is an example of a woman who back in just 20, 2015 went for a mammogram at a community hospital. That mammogram was positive and she was told because she was uninsured and underinsured that she needed a mastectomy to remove her breast for, for, for cancer. She was never told what stage she had. She was never told what options she had, but because she was uninsured and underinsured, she was only given the option of a mastectomy, removing her breast. Luckily, luckily there was a community health worker at that community hospital and said, you know what? I think you need to get have more conversations. She was referred to an academic medical center by a community health worker, not a provider. I mean, some a lay, a lay community health worker. That community health worker, referred her to an academic medical center, come to find out the type of breast cancer she had did not need a mastectomy. She was able to get a lump back in where they removed the lump and she was able to get treated. But what if that community health worker had not been there? So I give this example because this same woman who had this systemic, this issue with systemic racism in the healthcare system, imagine when we go to approach her and say, oh, we have the new vaccine now that has got an emergency use authorization. We want you to get vaccinated. She's gonna look at you what I call the side eye and justifiably so and be like, no, do I really wanna trust this healthcare system? So we have to bring, understand how our patients bring their lived experience to this work. And so nomenclature matters, I talk about that, but also this concept of vaccine hesitancy is connected to overall vaccine hesitancy. I wanna disrupt this myth that we just began to have vaccine hesitancy with the advent of the COVID-19 study. Vaccine hesitancy has been going on for decades and it's been rooted in a lot of misinformation around vaccine, but it's also been rooted in a, the fact that we're not often at the table for the research studies. So lastly, I wanna talk about what we've been able to do moving from myths to facts. So at Miles Square, due to the efforts of people that I talked about, we've been able to vac vaccinate over 8,274 people since March, and that's just within our FQHCs. And of those 8,274 people that have been vaccinated, 43.5% have been African-American, 47.6% have been Hispanic or Latino. Those efforts have been directly related to community-based organizations. Our recruitment and our outreach efforts were done by community-based partners to increase access and awareness to the vaccines. We've been able to test over 5,079 community members for a COVID-19 testing. And we do that right at our FQHC spaces. And so I'm gonna end with that and talk about the fact that we have to do this together. We have to remove the judgment and the stigma from it and understand that COVID-19 pandemic did not highlight anything new. It just, it just highlighted what we already knew, that structural racism impacts the outcomes that we see in black and brown and other underserved and marginalized communities. Thank you all so much for this opportunity to share. I look forward to sharing more in the, in the Q&A. And again, I hope this, this, this conversation lives up to the legacy of Dr. Holt. Thank you all so much. Thank you very much, Dr. Watson. Um, I'd like to invite uh, Dr. Harrington to speak to us, please. Thank you. Can everyone see my screen here? Yes. All right. 
So good afternoon. Uh, my name is Dr. Jaira Harrington, Assistant Professor in Black Studies, and thank you so much for this opportunity to share my work. Um, the work that is being done across the board around COVID and the panelists here today, it's a, an incredibly humbling and sobering reminder of all that is going on around us. Um, and this is also a time for celebration. So congratulations to the graduates this year, and also congratulations to us all for making it through what have been challenging times, um, not just here in Chicago, not just here in the state, not just here in this country, but all around the world. I will begin my presentation, Essential Yet Expendable, Brazilian Black Women and Domestic Work in the Age of COVID-19. And here's an overview. So I begin by contextualizing the vulnerable status of Brazilian Black women in both geographic and historical frameworks to help us understand the implications of gender, race, and capitalism on the profession of domestic work. Then I will talk about the term necropolitics and its analytic utility toward understanding the precarious state of Brazilian domestic workers. Next, I will address the global implications of inequality as it relates to COVID-19. And finally, I will take up some remaining questions for our Black communities globally, globally with lingering puzzles. Brazilian Black women and domestic work. Although their profession is widely understood to be a pillar of Brazilian society, domestic workers face ongoing discrimination and neglect resulting from institutionalized racism, sexism, and classism. Now with the ongoing disastrous effects of COVID-19, their lives are threatened by the profession's uncertainty and lack of state protection. Grounded in a necropolitics framework, my research complicates the competing narratives that surround domestic work. While the profession's brutal legacy of Black women's undervalued labor is romanticized by intimacy and care, life and death policy decisions around domestic workers during the COVID-19 pandemic underscores their community's vulnerable status. The origin of this romanticized view of Black women's domestic work is rooted in the history of colonization and slavery in Brazil. It has been racialized and gendered as Black women's work. Long after the 1888 abolition of slavery, Black women's bodies continued to be naturalized to a position of servitude in broader society. Domestic workers' labor commonly include general cleaning, ironing, sweeping, mopping, and washing clothing. Domestics may also be responsible for intimate caregiving with children, the infirmed, disabled, or elderly. With care, a life-giving social force, the demand for the domestic workers' labor continues and has increased during the ongoing pandemic. Care labor is considered essential, yet domestics' inherent value as a vulnerable and protected group is at odds with the larger profit-driven economic mechanisms in place that require their bodies' physical labor to work. In some, their lives are deemed expendable. Mabembe defines necropolitics as the ultimate expression of sovereignty, which resides to a large degree in the power to dictate who may live and who must die. Ultimately, the control over mortality is the domain of the state. In the case of domestic work during a global pandemic, the private yet public facing physical labor of the black men's body yields to the previously existing subjugated structures. This is a dilemma in which the totality of a domestic value rests in their ability to contribute to and stimulate the stalled economy. As stated earlier, the space that domestic workers occupy is framed in terms of the life-giving power that their work produces. However, the residual impact of COVID-19 pulls this group nearer to possible death. In fact, Brazilian domestic workers push back on essential worker status, which was in itself a conundrum. Their work cannot be conducted remotely, which could impact livelihoods, but facing a commute and working outside of their home, they could quite literally face a deadly virus. This seemingly abstract theory of necropolitics has played out in practice with the Brazilian federal government's response to COVID-19. From the beginning of the pandemic's emergence, Brazilian President Jair Bolsonaro 
minimize the severity of the virus, referring to it as a little flu. Absent a coordinated federal plan, the government failed to limit the spread of COVID-19. In its place, misinformation continued to spread. And I'll pause for a minute just because we might see some trends happening over the world, all over the world as it relates to information, misinformation, and initial downplaying of the virus. Eventually, Brazil became the pandemic epicenter in Latin America and reported the second highest number of infections in the world. At present, nearly 400,000 people have perished in Brazil during, due to COVID-19. In fact, more than 3,100 Brazilians sadly have died in the past 24 hours. Due to Brazil's deeply rooted racial and social inequities, citizens with the least resources are the most prone to the wrath of COVID-19. Brazilian domestic workers positioned at the intersections of gendered, racialized, and class oppressions present a lens through which the deep consequences of COVID-19 are clear. Though the pandemic has ravaged the entire country, the deadly and disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on poor Black Brazilian communities is alarming. We can also see parallels in the United States, as we've heard from our previous presenters, in terms of the disproportionate impact of COVID-19 on Black, Latinx, and poor communities. COVID-19 in global perspective. While we can see pre-existing racial, gender, and class inequities in Brazil are only underscored by the pandemic, we can also attend to questions of global inequity with the latest tool to combat COVID-19, the vaccine. COVAX is a coordinated effort by global leaders to ensure equitable distribution of the vaccine. Now looking here at its current rate, Brazil will be able to achieve widespread vaccine coverage by 2022. By comparison, the United States and the whole of Western Europe is on track to do so in late 2021 this year. Also note, there are 84 other countries, mainly in Africa and Southeast Asia, that may not achieve this goal until 2023. Like the South African, United Kingdom, and Brazil variants of COVID-19, it demonstrates evidence of being more easily transmissible and perhaps more deadly. Vaccinated resistance to these strains is still unknown and mutations will likely continue as the, as the disease continues unabated. Now as the second map, we see vaccine doses distributed per 100 people. In the US, there are between 30 to 100 doses. And in Brazil, we see between three to 10. We know in both countries, vaccine access is unequal along racial and socioeconomic lines. While this commentary on hoarding of vital resources during a pandemic is a global intervention, I must also note that we have seen evidence of such hoarding and reduced access right here in Chicago. So for example, Loretto Hospital is a recent example where key healthcare executives took doses earmarked for predominantly black, hard hit Austin community and vaccinated friends and associates. The uneven and unequal vaccine rollout at local, national and global scales is troubling to the health of the global community. And it threatens to extend the life of the pandemic and can cost the lives of millions. While necropolitics is helpful for a macro analysis of global vaccine distribution, it also reminds us of how human lives in the developing world are systematically and dependent on the political, social, and economic decisions of wealthier global powers. These human lives are at the mercy of political projects that minimize and ignore the interdependence of one of our most priceless public goods, our collective health. Now for some lingering puzzles. With an intense focus on marginalized communities in Brazil and the specific marginalized community of domestic workers, we see the fatal implications of COVID-19. We also bear witness to the anti-Black and gendered dimensions of their experience. We can further explore larger questions at play in global power structures, but many questions remain. For the most marginal in a pandemic, where can safety be found? 
Who can experience the right to body, autonomy, life, and security? Who is fungible? Who is available for death? At what expense? Brazilian domestic workers experience the weight of necropolitics in both arbitrary and routinized ways. The ramifications of death present itself economically, socially, and with adverse health outcomes. COVID-19, as stated before, and we will likely say it again, is not laying bare these realities. The pandemic simply underscores the necropolitical conditions that are endemic to society. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Harrington. And I'd like now to invite our final panelist, Dr. Jennifer Breyer. Thank you so much. I'm going to share my screen. And I know you're looking at not what you want to look at yet, but when I do this, can you now see the proper screen? Yes. Okay, great. Yeah. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to move you all out of my way so I can see my notes, which is its own thing. So over the last six years, I've had the privilege of collaborating with almost 40 women living with HIV, um, some for more than 40 years, and almost all of them are part of the Women's Interagency HIV Study, which is um, the longest running longitudinal study of the natural history of HIV um, in women and people assigned female at birth. It is a profound data set, a uh, quantitative data set. Um, the project that I've been working on with them is deeply qualitative. Um, and we've been working with these survivors um, in one of three locations, Chicago, Brooklyn, and Raleigh, Durham. And I'm gonna show, me, introduce you to two of the women today. And that has really changed how I think about HIV AIDS in the late 20th century and very much now during the COVID-19 pandemic. When Dr. Rhodes introduced um, the conversation and started with AIDS, um, there is this moment where it is just important to say that we are living during a time of COVID and we are living during a time of AIDS. We are living during a time of syndemics. Um, and it's a, a really incredible opportunity to get to listen to the projects um, from, from my colleagues and understand how a longer history of HIV can fit in this story today. Um, and so I guess what I wanna say is that this project has really um, not only changed the way I think about what it means to locate the historical evidence of black women's survival in the past, um, but most importantly, what it means to put women at the center of history. And that when we do that, it changes the, the scope and the significance of the history that we see. So we are coming up on what for many will be the 40th anniversary of the first published reported cases of the disease that would come to be known as AIDS. Those first reports happened in the summer of 1981. Um, what those reports didn't tell us was that Black women and their children were among the first people dying from this condition that would soon be called AIDS. Um, you can see there are different reports that come out in December, different times um, sort of in 1981, but it's when you turn to um, historical accounts and memories that people had that you understand uh, the, the significance and the scope of this. So I found an interview with a longtime nurse, black nurse named Maxine Frary, who worked at Harlem Hospital in New York City. And she recounted what it was like to work in the hospital in the 1970s. And she said, infants started to mysteriously die in the late 1970s. We had no diagnosis of HIV at the time. They were coming in with fever of unknown origin and a failure to thrive. The moms were mostly heroin addicts at the time or on methadone. We decided that Jesus had to be the father because there were no fathers involved in any of these children's care. And I give you that example simply to say that when we um, as historians 
push back against what we believe the data is at the time and start to look around it, we're able to see things really differently. And that is um, what I try to do in this project. So I want you to meet Deborah. Um, who was a black lesbian born in the early 1960s on Chicago's West Side. I have a feeling, um, Dr. Watson, that she may have been in that one square mile that Mile Square is named for, um, where she grew up and experienced um, profound and significant childhood trauma, gender-based violence and police violence as a young person. Um, I interviewed her and have continued to speak with her over the last six years. And in the 2015 interview that she did, um, she talked about her history of trauma, um, her history of drug use and incarceration and the role that incarceration played in her life as a black woman. I'm not gonna play the clip about her early life today, given the timing, but I wanna draw your attention to the fact that Deborah has some of the most stunning analysis of structural causes of ill health um, that we might imagine. So I'll play a clip from her now. So yeah, I ended up in the penitentiary with my youngest daughter, with a friend. My second diagnosis in five years still not knowing what it is that I have, got out of the penitentiary and there was a DCFS worker waiting for me at the gate. And he told me that if I thought I wanted my kids back, I probably wouldn't get them back because I had HIV. but he brought me to the wrong place. He took me to the Fantas Clinic at Stroger Hospital. Exactly. But what year was that? This was 91. Okay. Well, who was there at the same, same time? Same Same okay. time. Yeah. And, you know, that was his mistake, taking me to exactly. the Fantas Clinic. Because not only did they educate me about HIV, they educated me about my rights concerning HIV. Exactly. and you know, that nobody could take my child simply because, mm -hmm. you know, there were people trying to. At the Fantas Clinic in the basement um, of Cook County Hospital in the Radiation Center, where Deborah notes um, many people were being treated for cancer and maybe Dr. Watson, we could talk about the links between cancer and um, HIV. Deborah met a group of women, the majority of whom were black, who were all living with HIV and being cared for by a group of black and white feminist healthcare providers led by Dr. Marge Cohen and um, not yet doctor, but soon to be Dr. Mildred Williamson who actually works at the University of Illinois, Chicago. At the Women and Children Clinic, Cohen and Williamson asked women living with HIV to articulate their own health and wellness needs, whether in the form of demanding spaces for childcare, women-centered safer sex education or parental education. Deborah and the women she met not only gave lie to the claim that AIDS was initially a white gay male disease, but just importantly gave voice to their own HIV AIDS expertise. They amplified the ideas that care for people living with HIV needed to be more than access to medical treatment and has to include a wide range of social and economic supports to produce um, the very conditions, the, to, to sort of address the very conditions that produce epidemics and pandemics. One of these orange cards belongs to Deborah. She got it when she went to the Fantas Clinic at Cook County. And on the day that I first met the Chicago women down the block from, um, from Cook County Hospital, now Stroger Hospital in 19, uh, in, excuse me, in 2014, I asked them if they had any material items in their possession that spoke to their experiences at the Women and Children Clinic at the Radiation Center. And about half a dozen of them pulled out these orange cards that read, always bring this card with you. Um, when Deborah and I sat down together to look at her pictures a couple weeks later, I went up to where she was living at the time. She let me scan hers and her late partners. And she said to me, I have three numbers in my life, my social security number, my penitentiary number from Dwight and my Cook County number. Deborah's words are evidence um, of the women's history of HIV, one that is as much about the state 
incarceration and public hospitals as it is about sexual behaviors or drug use. This is a picture of Deborah taken with her partner, whose card I showed you above. It was taken on Mother's Day, which is coming up, um, at the Chicago Women's AIDS Project house on the for, far now, north side of Chicago. And I wanna play you this clip. I did my volunteer work. I did the Maytech training, you know, <laughs> that because nobody wanted to be with the AIDS patients in Cook County Hospital. So what they do, they trained the AIDS patients right. to go sit with the AIDS patients. Exactly. Because we knew that, you know, there's nothing, go we, we knew we needed comfort. Exactly. So we, we took these classes and we went and we comfort our people. I think that's one of the most powerful quotes in the thousands of quotes that we have collected from the women from the Women's History Project, we cared for our people. At the same time that Deborah was at the Radiation Center, um, there was a whole sort of emerging um, world of women's activism around, uh, around AIDS care and treatment and survival, which I don't have time to talk about. I just wanna show you, then I'll end, um, I won't be able to, to introduce you to all of these other people that, um, that this project that uh, I've launched in, in December on World AIDS Day, December 2020, um, is about the almost 40 women um, who are living with um, HIV today and putting them at the center of this history, I think changes everything we think we know about the AIDS epidemic, including that it is still with us and we are still in a time, as I said, at the top of AIDS and a time of COVID. Um, and I think the most important thing that we learn, and it is really just an echo of what um, my colleagues have said today, that health must always be more than the absence of disease and that biomedicine will never be sufficient to make us healthy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Breyer, and thank all our panelists for a uh, really insightful, insightful presentations today. And I'd like to open it up for, for uh, questions right now for those of you who have sent it through the chat. Let me just take a look here. Let's see. And maybe I'll start with one uh, that I've been thinking about as I listen to all four presentations, and it is um, um, directed principally at uh, Dr. Gallen when you spoke earlier about um, unstructured data, right? And the importance, and I, I was thinking about uh, your reference to it when I was also listening to Dr. Watson um, movingly tell us about um, commemorating his family member. Um, how does, if you could say a little bit more about how the focus on structured data allows us to kind of elude what you call the datification yeah. of Black experience? Sure. Um, it's interesting. I'll just talk about this briefly, and I'm writing about this now. Um, when I talk about unstructured data, I'm really talking about, you know, text, right? Um, and what we do is actually in terms of the Homegoing Project, we take unstructured data, data text and datafy it or uh, take it and move it into quantified, quantif um, quantitative data, right? So the, the process of humanizing um, the data requires us to actually dehumanize it first, put it in a spreadsheet to then rehumanize it. Um, and what we're trying to do is, you know, get at the, the story and the life. Now the story is already um, in an obituary to some degree or a death announcement. And there's been a variety of memorial projects on um, people who've died from COVID, but we were particularly trying to, to take it from um, these unstructured data formats and then move it into a context that really reconcile uh, the notion of being black with um, you know, African aesthetics, uh, African culture, African American history in terms of home going, give it movement, and also wrestle with the idea that when you're re recovering Black people's lives, you're recovering their experiences both in the most sort of richest of ways, but you're also recovering the, 
the oppressive parts of their identity also or the oppression that they experience as well. And that tension between wanting to recover and restore black humanity, but also understanding and recovering that you're also recovering, you know, systematic oppression, systematic racism. And so that's what homegoing wrestles with, right? And telling the story about the black experience and how it's been impacted by COVID-19. Un uh, unfortunately, you're also telling a story again about systemic racism, but needing to balance that with recovering who Black people are. Systemic racism doesn't define Black people, but it is part of the experience that we that we have. Yes. Thank you. Uh, could I just um, add something to that, if that's okay? Um, what so what? One of the connections in some ways between AIDS and COVID is also about, um, about uh, the ways that we think about, I think in some ways qualitative data. And for me, the decision to, in this project, focus on people who have survived, who live with HIV AIDS has been a way to also um, get at that. And there are, it's complicated, you know, like that doesn't deny the fact that in fact, two of the women who are in the project have died since the project started. And part of what happened to me was I was like, but they can't die. They are in a living women's history of HIV. How are they not here anymore? When of course we know that that's, you know, just because I call it that doesn't mean that it's always gonna be true. But what does it mean to sort of think about how the work that a project like COVID Black can also do to structure the data of survival, um, I think also relates to, to, what, um, to what Dr. Watson also is talking about, like how we think about um, what are the kinds of things that will uh, really respond to people's very justified hesitancy in ways that, that concentrate on survival strategies and how those survival strategies can help um, make people healthy. I just want to just respond really quickly to that, Jennifer, because I think that's what makes your project so incredibly rich because there is an overemphasis, both in popular culture, but even in ac uh, academic studies of uh, Black people dying. And so to think about the notion of living with HIV and the notion of life, I think is incredibly important. And I'll just say that, you know, one of the emerging uh, crises and public health crises, and I know Dr. Watson knows this very well, is people suffering from long COVID. Long COVID. Right? And because there is an overemphasis on the mortality data for Black people, there is the way that um, people living with long COVID and that long-term impact um, if we're not careful, we're not going to be uh, paying attention to those people who are, are dealing with the impact of COVID in that way. I couldn't agree more. Uh, we have a question that has come in for um, Dr. Harrington, and I'll just uh, post it to you, um, Jaira. Thinking about the issues around data, uh, I'm interested in hearing Dr. Harrington talk about how data collection on race, gender, um, and COVID is going on in Brazil and how sh sh you're dealing with uh, the data issues in your work. Thank you for that question. Um, it actually mirrors much of the conversation that we've been having about the United States around data collection on race that initially there really wasn't much data collected in, in the first place. And much of my experience did take a humanistic perspective in conversations that I had with the community that I work with. So with um, domestic worker organizers who told me about the, um, the, contact tracing that was emerging from just uh, community organizations and creating the tapestry around understanding the impact of COVID-19 on the most marginal communities of Brazil. And so until fairly recently, um, much of my work had looked like uh, the humanistic studies of, um, of Dr. Gallen and thinking through the similar kinds of systemic issues that again, are only exacerbated through this crisis. Um, it, it, was, it, it still remains uh, to be a challenge uh, collecting that kind of data, 
um, but also again with these um, conversations that are becoming increasingly transnational, exchanging this data and information, understanding that um, what is impacting uh, marginal communities in Brazil has rippling impacts in communities all around the world, that this is a um, pandemic, that this is a, a challenge that we're facing as a global community. Um, the responses to and the, the need for that, that, that kind of data um, has, has only increased and um, now public health scholars are much more attentive to these sorts of intersectional um, identities and how it is that COVID-19 um, it has has its impacts in a variety of ways throughout societies all over the world. Thank you. Uh, I feel like we're just getting started with our conversation, and we're, we're finally really we're just uh, it's getting richer and richer. But unfortunately, we do need to close down for today. And I just really want to say thank you to our four panelists who just provided us with a wonderfully insightful, you know, empowering and um, just fantastic presentations. We, I really want to say thank you to all of them. Thanks to everyone. And don't go away, stay with us. Um, I just have to say I'm blown away by the work and the ways in which you all tied uh, the local and the global and across um, all of the different communities um, I think you brought home for us and provided data and insight. We are still trying to make sense of this crisis. We're still in the middle of it. So thank you so much for all of your work. Um, and uh, uh, we will um, post your research if you provide it for us, we'll make sure to make it available. Um, we will encourage students to engage with your work and to get out there in the community. Um, two quick uh, things that I wanna highlight and maybe Brianna can put these in the chat is that we have a, a recently updated uh, resource page where you can find out about how to get a COVID vaccine and how to find appointments for friends and family. So that'll get posted in the chat. And if you want to stay connected with Black Studies around this or other issues, we have Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter um, platforms. Uh, so please uh, send us your ideas, communicate, and build community. Now we, I have the great pleasure of paying some attention to our amazing students. Um, and so I think we're going to see some images uh, that will highlight uh, our student award recipients for this year. Ordinarily, as many of you know, um, we gather uh, in the African American Cultural Center and um, have food and stand around and, and have community and celebration. And we're not able to do that this year, but um, we hope that uh, all of you know how much we admire and, and appreciate you. Um, I'm gonna start with the presentation of the Black Studies Departmental Award. Uh, this award is for majors and minors and students who've taken substantial uh, numbers of Black Studies um, classes, and it recognizes their academic achievement. Uh, the first uh, awardee is Jasmine Hoffner, and you've seen Jasmine uh, communicating in the chat today. Jasmine is uh, a major in Black Studies. She's a junior um, originally from South Carolina who moved to Chicago about three years ago. Um, in uh, her nomination, her professors wrote that Jasmine has been an exceptional and outstanding student since her arrival at UIC, producing nuanced analyses of African-American literature and other topics with a key eye, keen eye for African diasporic visible, visual cultures. Her enthusiastic presence and insightful engagement in our classes and department have helped push our critical conversations further and build our departmental culture. After graduation, she plans on pursuing a doctorate in Black Studies. So congratulations to you, Jasmine. We're very excited about your uh, career goals and we look forward to having you as a colleague one day, perhaps participating in an event like this. Um, next recipient is Susan Singleton. Uh, Susan is a Black Studies and Anthropology double major uh, with a minor in Spanish. 
She was raised in Baton Rouge, Louisiana and transferred here from LSU. Um, and she is working, um, as I mentioned, in a dual degree. She's also an ambassador for the Honors College and writes for the Ampersand Student Publication. One of her professors described how Susan's engagement with challenging graduate level material was remarkable, while another praised her preparation, confidence, and critical sophistication as being on par with graduate students. Also, like Jasmine, uh, Susan plans to pursue graduate studies and become a professor of Black Studies. So the dream department will be Jasmine and Susan together as professors carrying on as the next generation of Black Studies scholars. So congratulations to you, Susan. Tristan Ortiz has been awarded an honorable mention uh, for the Black Studies Departmental Award. Tristan is an undergraduate in the Department of English. He's an aspiring writer and filmmaker who seeks to use the power of visual media to mobilize against neoliberal narratives that distort our reality. He's worked on a multimedia project, The Backward River, that it reimagines narratives about the Chicago River to address environmental justice issues. Um, Tristan has also worked as a media instructor with youth from underserved communities to help them create their own advocacy videos. His professor descri described him as an outstanding and thoughtful vocal, thoughtfully vocal student whose presence was invaluable and that he has distinguished himself as an adept close reader and insightful literary analyst and a creative critic with outsized brilliance. So congratulations to you also, Tristan. Next, I want to present the Grace Holt Memorial Award. Um, this award goes to both undergraduate and graduate students um, with a particular focus on those who work actively to improve the lives of Black people. Um, and who have a commitment to racial justice. The Grace Holt Memorial Award also recognizes academic achievement. So the first recipient is Praval Banga. Praval is an undergraduate with a major in criminology, law and justice and two minors in political science and black studies. Praval is a native of Weill, Illinois and she is on the pre-law track and also an honors student. A first-generation college student and an aspiring lawyer, Praval plans to use her studies to go into civil rights law or international human rights law. She's organized and participated in various community efforts, including organizing a fundraiser for the Chicago youth-led grassroots organization called Good Cad Kids Mad City, which brought in over $5,000. She also was an organizer for the Say Her Names rally at Downers Grove, which brought an estimated 5,000 people. On campus, she's the current president of Collegiate 100, co-founder and vice president of the Wonder Chapter of the NACWC, and is a member of the Honors College. She hopes that her passions will help her transform the world. Her professors clearly believe that she will, writing that, quote, in each class, she stood out in terms of sheer enthusiasm and exceptional performance. Uh, another professor wrote that during these discussions, she often incorporated her own activist inclinations and experiences into more abstract themes. So we are looking forward to exciting things from Paval. Congratulations to you. Our next recipient is Brian Kolar. Brian is a doctoral student in policy studies in the Ur urban education program here at UIC. A native of Chicago and a Ronald McNair scholar, Brian received his master's degree in clinical community psychology from the University of South Carolina. Broadly, his research interests are the intersectionality of trauma and mental health and transformation within bodies of color. In his work as a trained clinical community psychologist, Brian continues to work locally with juveniles in detention centers, spaces of domestic abuse, and within CPS. As one of his professors observed, quote, his teaching and research pushes the boundaries of how we think about education and promises to contribute to knowledge about the challenges and possibilities of community-based practice centered in resistance and justice. Brian maintains strong community connections to young people inside and outside of K through 12 schools. Everyone has been 
impressed with his decisions to complete his doctoral studies while making these tangible connections. Um, and we offer you the greatest of congratulations, Brian. The next recipient of the uh, Grace Holt Memorial Award is Sikordri Ojo. Sikordri is a doctoral student in the Department of History. She was born and raised on the south side of Chicago and attended DePaul University where she majored in history and African-American and Black diaspora studies. After graduating from DePaul, Sikorji joined Teach for America in 2014, where she taught reading and history on the south side of Chicago. Sikorji's current research examines the intellectual contributions of African-American women teachers living and teaching in the Southern United States during the 19th and 20th century. Specifically, she researches how African-American women have historically used education as a tool to redefine what it means to be African-American. Sikorji's research also includes the study of politically and socially organized forms of African-American women's resistance against racial power structures and institutions within the US. As one of her references wrote, quote, she stood out from the start as an exceptionally thoughtful, careful, perceptive student, pushing herself and her classmates to confront the point and significance of what they're studying with an underlying abiding dedication to the study of Black and women's history in its widest context. Congratulations to you, Sikordri. Our next candidate for the Grace Holt Memorial Award is Sanji Ravachandran. Sanji, or Sanji, as she's known, is a doctoral student in the Department of Sociology. She has a Master's of Art in Art Therapy as well. She has worked alongside survivors of interpersonal and state violence for over 10 years. Her current research examines racialized genomic biosurveillance with a focus on connections between feminism, carcerality, and liberal counterinsurgency. She's a prison abolitionist and currently organizes with Love and Protect. Sanji's activist scholarship is described by one professor as, quote, absolutely outstanding demonstrating a profound understanding of the ethical dilemmas involved in research with marginalized populations. And she consistently works to ensure that research remains collaborative, respectful, and accountable to community partners. They also note that Sanghi's years of experience as a rape crisis advocate provides her with a grounded understanding of the complex network of connections between feminist, anti-violence activists, and the carceral state. Um, everyone predicts that this is going to be a truly fantastic dissertation. Congratulations to you, Sangi. And as many of you know, Sangi uh, hosted and organized an amazing uh, program this Tuesday um, for students in her course that brought um, abolitionist activists to campus to talk about their work. So all of these recipients are communicating and committing their lives and their work and their intellectual energies, both to uh, the community and to uh, the Black Studies Department and their home departments here at UIC. So again, congratulations to all of you. Thank you so much for your hard work and your efforts. Finally, we'd like to uh, recognize uh, our students who are graduating. Congratulations to all of you. We wish we could be with you in person. We wish we could um, uh, be in community, but um, please know that we're all thinking of you and we're all so proud of your accomplishments. Um, those graduating are all Black Studies minors, Kiara Harden, Judith Joseph, Nicolette Metier, Angela Pugh, and Jasmine Roberson. You've worked hard um, and you deserve all successes. And I want to ask you um, on behalf of the Black Studies Department to stay in touch with us, um, to stay part of our community, to uh, remain connected to UIC, um, and to uh, play it forward for the next generation. So thanks to all of you. Congratulations to the students. Uh, we are so proud of you. Um, and I want to uh, once again, uh, turn to uh, the panelists um, and uh, for all of us to give them uh, a huge uh, virtual clap. 
Um, and thank you. Um, all of your work is um, helping to change the world. And we all need to learn more about the COVID crisis. Um, well, that's it for our program. We wanted to keep it within a time frame so that you could be here and then go off to your classes and, and your other commitments uh, this afternoon. Uh, but I'd once again like to thank uh, Dr. Kim Gallen from Purdue University, Kareem Watson from the School of Public Health and the Miles Square Center, Professor Jennifer Breyer from the Gender and Women's Studies Department, and Professor Jaira Harrington from Black Studies, and to the moderator, Ainsworth Clark. Thanks all of you and um, good luck with final exams. Um, and uh, I hope you find some peace and relaxation during the summer break. So thanks to all of you. Bye -bye. Thank you so much for having us all together, Dr. Rhodes. Thank you, thank you. Stay well, everyone. Bye-bye. <laughs>